while this is happening, her and Grim are doing a heckin' flirty McFlirt flirt. Things are happening. He takes her t- for chocolate. <laughs> yeah, that was so weird. He loves chocolate. <laughs> Relatable. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast, Unresolved Textual Tension. It is me, your host, Maria, and my rugged and handsome co-host William extra rugged extra handsome all right what book are we doing today well we read white lark and here's the thing guys this book was infamous on tiktok because it was believed that the author was an industry plant a plant because basically she'd written a middle school book before and then this book, um, she had a post talking about it um, on TikTok that just blew up all of a sudden. And she got a publishing deal um, and a movie deal. Before the book came out, she got a movie deal and people got real heckin' suspicious. Yeah, they're like, okay, what's going on? And her sister is a millionaire and her parents own like a car park or something. And so people were like, okay, this is definitely an industry plant. And people hate this book it got review bombed on goodreads and so i was like okay i'm not necessarily interested in the tiktok drama of it but let's look at what how good the book is itself or how bad the book is itself because i was going in here expecting a train wreck and maria what did we get it's not that bad is it good? No. It's not terrible, guys. Like It's not. It's not good, but it's not as bad as some of the other books we've read. We've read some real doozy. Save Your Sister, uh, Cyborg Tinker. This is, by and large, not terrible. Like, again, it's not good. Nobody would ever right. read Like, I'm sure there are some people who this is their cup of tea, and they'd, like, read it and be like, this was a great time. I loved it. Which, you know, fine. But it, it, it wasn't, like, there's a lot of reviews... <laughs> There's a lot of reviews that like tearing this book apart. And it was funny because like when we read Savior's Champion, it is mainly good reviews. There are bad reviews, but it like holds like a 4.2 or something on Goodreads. And then this book, this book is sitting low because of all the negative reviews. And it really just wasn't like the thing is, I know you guys want a salacious video (laughs) where we just tear apart the book. And listen, I have issues. Oh, oh, do I have issues? And like, uh, might there be parts that Will and I laugh at because of the absolute absurdity? Is the ending convoluted as fuck? Does she really need to learn some better naming conventions? (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Is the romance at once too obvious and cliche and then weirdly like convoluted? Yes. You know what it is? It's a book that you have to be on the wavelength of. And I very quickly fell into the wavelength of, oh, uh, this is a middle schooler writing their book. And like the pros aren't terrible, even though they're a middle schooler. And so like if you're in the like middle schooler where you're like, I like Avatar, but what if they all the names ended with Ling? Like Lightling and Sunling and Moonling. It definitely has. And Will and I have mentioned this before. The, the book Keeper. There's a certain mindset you have to read when you read the book Keeper. And it's like a middle grade mindset in the sense that like I could see it as like a TV show uh, on uh, early morning on Cartoon Network or on Fox Kids, like those kinds of vibes, like the Winx Club, Totally Spies. This book has that kind of vibe. The main character has that kind of vibe. There are ways in which it then smacks you out of that mindset because then I don't know people are orgasming (laughs) there is a very painful uh scene of intimacy later in the book that uh maria especially disliked and i was just like really don't lie it does feel like a middle school book that somebody constructed and then had an editor go through and edit all of the really bad prose out of and replace with fairly like again these are not great prose but they're actually not awful or painful to read like some of the other books it's just straightforward it's it's straightforward it's relatively clean the author has a problem with meanly like smiled meanly looked meanly happens a ton besides that (laughs) and the dumb naming conventions the writing itself is fine there was a couple of scenes that were well described that had some pretty imagery to it uh and so i won't take that away in fact i like the way parts of the ending are written I just don't like 
what's happening. The character has an actual arc, which is somewhat surprising. Um, and it's like, sometimes she thinks about her arc too much. There's a sense that the author likes the character a little bit too much. But again, that's almost just a middle school vibe of like, oh, this is a little bit of a Mary Sue, but like, not irritatingly. Again, I'm going to go back to The Savior's Champion because that book and its sequel are so annoying. That's a book where like their main characters don't have an arc. And also the main, the author really likes the main characters, but in a kind of superior way where this is just almost, it's an earnest book. Like this is just an earnest book. I think this author very much loved the story she was writing. I think this is the story she intended to write. It doesn't have, as Will said, like a vibe of superiority to it. Earnest is a dang good word. It's it's not good. It's not terrible. It is earnest. I think without this whole TikTok industry plant thing, I think the book would actually have relatively good reviews because I think what happened is that, you know, it got consumed by people who it was never actually really designed to consume or people who normally would have just did not finish at like 10% in or something like that. I wouldn't have thought about it again. But again, we are going to have some fun roasting parts of this book. <laughs> yes. And I also think Alex Astor is one of those situations where she was very beloved on book talk for a while. And then like the tides have turned and, you know, which is like on the internet. Oh man, that can happen at the drop of a hat. We are waiting for ours to happen still. I don't want it to happen. I'm too weak and mushy. We haven't even gotten Beloved yet, but we're going to get Beloved at some point, and then we're going to get cast into the pit of fire. But I do agree that, because it, it was weird to me that some of the books that we've read that we haven't liked or thought that were really good had better reviews than this. Meanwhile, I would think that they were the same. And again, not that I think that those other books or that this deserves like a 4.5 stars. I don't. It's just that normally I think the people that would have read this book would have liked this book had it not been, as Will said, for all the drama surrounding it. And again, I think if you cut out the sex scene and the, some of the uh, horniness, then it's like it's a fair middle school book. Like this is something you would read on Wattpad and be like, oh, this is surprisingly not terrible. Well, I will say the character's arc was decent. Um, there were some things like some interesting action scenes. The death competition was not the worst death competition. <laughs> Mostly because it's not really in there a lot. There's like four challenges and then it kind of just forgets about it. And it's like, okay, scavenger hunt side quest. But before we get started on that, Will, I have a question for you. Do we have a... A Patreon? Wait a minute. You mean there's a place people can go to support the podcast? Yeah. And they get access to videos early without ads. And they can join a book club where they get to pick the book that we read and then we live stream it to them? Yeah. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That would be such a cool service to provide to our viewers. And such a good way for us to get to know them and interact with them. And like, it's, it's, I would imagine it would be a fun time. All right, let's go ahead and get into it though. What is the premise of Light Lark? There was once a lovely kingdom uh, ruled by six realms. Uh, and the capital of it was Light Lark. Uh, the realms are... And get ready, guys. This is going to be real hard to remember. <laughs> Sunling, Skyling, Moonling, Starling, Wildling. And get ready. You would think it would continue with the same convention, but no, Nightshade. Out of nowhere. It's so odd. I guess maybe Nightling didn't have, like, the right vibe. And I think they were, we were going for, like, a dark, sexy vibe for the Nightshade people's. But it's, it's a real weird, like, if you set up a naming convention, even if it's kind of a dumb one, and woo is this one kind of dumb? Just like, I, I don't know, stick with it. It's weird, because, yeah, it's only one, and it's like, okay, they're the dark, sexy ones, so we can't call them Nightlings, but Nightshade is close enough, and you're like... Wait till we get to the name of the Nightshade character. It's uh, also really creatively picked. But anyway, um, and these six realms lived in unison harmony, until the Fire Nation attacked. No, until <laughs> <laughs> until uh, like five hundred years ago, there was a curse, and there something bad happened, and the curse has happened, and it cursed each of the realms in a terrible way that was very bad for like the realms themselves. So, for instance, the Wildlings, who were connected to wild magic and the earth and animals, and were very sex positive and full of lerve, 
uh, were cursed that if they fell in love with someone, they had to kill that person. And second, they had to eat human hearts. I'm not going to lie. That part feels like it came out of nowhere, especially when we get to some of the other curses. This art heart eating bit. And also they have to eat hearts. So like, what is the economy of hearts that's going on? Like, because they mentioned they have to eat like one a week and like, no, no, no. It's technically two a month. But while she's in the castle, she's being provided one a week. Okay. What's the economy going on there of, like, that's a lot of people to consume. Yes, especially because, like, you're, you're never told how many wildlings. We'll get there. I'll, I'll get to the, the reason why <laughs> we're going to go into that in a second. But anyway, the rest of the curses. The sunling people who like the heckin' sun cannot go out during the day. The sun will burn their skin, even though it is the source of their power. The moonling people cannot sail during a full moon. It's like the dumbest curse. It's the dumbest curse. Now, it like, so you just can't get near the ocean, which is, like, fine. I mean, maybe it's not fine because their castle is, like, in the middle of the sea. It's pointed out later that it's a stupid curse, but, like, it's still, but that's, like, three-fourths of the way through the book, and you're like, it's just a very weird, like, that's the thing is, the world building in this book feels really middle school it doesn't feel at all consistent we're going to talk about later how this is a semi-medieval setting and yet the main character is always wearing a tank top and shorts and at one mention at one point mentions the wire in her bra and you're like what that does not match with any of the other fashion statements we've heard about beforehand anyway so yeah that's the moonlings curse i might be missing part of it but yeah kind of kind of dumb doesn't really affect them much uh the nightshade curse is they can't go out at night. Which is mm. like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> also, easy to live with. And then, by far the worst fucking curse. Hands down the worst one. The starling people all die at 25. <laughs> Why? It's so much worse. I mean, it would have been set interesting if they used to be like the longest lived people. And so now they were cursed to be the most short-lived, but... There's no internal logic to the curses. Like, it's not a magic system that you're like, okay, this makes sense as the backlash of the magic that they had or something like that. Um, it's just kind of like... So, like, the nightshades can't go out during the day or something like that kind of makes sense, or the starlings can't survive under the light of the star. I don't know. Something like that where it's an internally consistent system, like an avatar... Like, that would make sense as the curses, but it's not. They're pretty random. And again, the nightshade curses and the sunling curses make sense. Like, you are now cut off from the source of your power. You can never fully be enveloped in it. Yeah, that's good. You can't sail during or be near the ocean during a full moon? Oh, okay. Uh, you die at 25 for no reason? You have to eat a heart? Like, that one at least... No, so that still doesn't really make... Oh, also, they have to kill the person they fall in love with. Now, I guess because the, the, part of the thing with being wildlings is they were known for their prolific love lives and for taking lots of lovers and loving deeply. So, like, that one's a curse that makes sense, and it does really fuck with your population if you are constantly killing the person you love. Though, I guess you could just, like, smash and dash, you know? Like, once a month, everybody goes into dark rooms just oh smashes. that is a good point yeah the, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can get your fix you don't know who it was it's a different person every time nobody has to worry people can still have kids yada yada we're fine and then for some reason they're mostly female now too i didn't quite catch why because apparently the female people are the ones killing their male lovers more often which is weird because the implication there is that the men weren't actually as in love with the women as they <laughs> women were with the men like it just it doesn't make sense. It's it, That's a curse where, like, it doesn't make sense that it would suddenly affect the gender dynamics of an entire population. These curses have brought great and terrible consequences down on the people. The other thing it did was, it did was uh, the capital of all of these realms, Lightlark, which was kind of like the heart and where all of them lived, was separated by a giant magical storm that rages for a hundred years. And so you can't get to Lightlark. Everyone who's in Lightlark is stuck there, everyone outside Light Lark. Uh, it also, when the curses happened, all of the rulers at the time died and their powers went to their next in line for the throne. And every 100 years, the storm around Light Lark does a heckin' calm down 
And then all the rulers from all the different realms can come back to like light lark and try break the curses. And there's a bunch of rules and things about how they do it at the end. One of them has to get elected to die. There's all these rules, but anyway, the star starts uh, with a wildling, the wildling ruler, Isla. Okay. Already. I hate it because it's pronounced Isla, but like, it sounds weird. It should be Isla. Like if you pronounce that in English, that's a, that name is pronounced Isla. The S is silent. So that was super annoying. There was that character in uh, that literally, I think was one of the names of the characters in for the wolf, the mom character. I'm pretty sure was Isla. Yeah. It's so uh, like that annoyed me the entire book, but that is a minor point. But yes, Isla is, or I'm going to probably call her Isla cause it's annoying is our main character. And she has just arrived from somewhere else because she has a magical, wand that lets her travel around the world despite the fact that everyone taking care of her in the castle thinks she's super isolated and is keeping her in a bird cage essentially and what is the name of this fantastical magical item that allows <laughs> her to spirit off into different realms in the universe a a star stick it, it's it's called her star stick <laughs> aster do you need some do you need do you want to just workshop some names girl listen i'm katie has said it before i'm pretty good at names i can help you get some cool looking names that that feel like a little magical and not just like a sixth grade girl went this is my star stick you know like I got you. Maybe email uh, Martin, Jar Jar Martin. See if you can get just like one email worth of names that aren't stupid. One or the other. Contact me or Martin. You know, both pretty equal in writing quality. Hey, yo. I love A Song of Ice and Fire. So that is a compliment to Maria. It is. Not a diss. It is a compliment to Maria, but it's one Maria is not necessarily willing to take. <laughs> 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 that is too much of a compliment. I cannot accept. Anyway, um, so Isla has come back. She's just been... A gallivanting with her star stick but tonight tonight is the night she has to address her people because she has to go to the what is it called the centennial the centennial thank you <laughs> she has to go to the centennial which is when the storm dies down and everybody goes to late lark and for a hundred days they can try break the curses together and so she's ready to go do this but sacre bleu Isla has no powers. And originally, when she's first talking to you, and then she's like, but I have no powers, you don't realize anyone really has powers. Like, you <laughs> haven't met anyone who does anything magical. So then she's like, and I have no powers. And you're like, how does that affect your life at all? But what you realize is that she should have powers. And they should be pretty powerful powers. She's a wildling. She's the wildling ruler. What she should be able to do is control plants. Basically, like, earthbender style, but plus proficiency in animal handling stereotypical druid stuff she ain't got none of that and so her caretakers tara and poppy have isolated her up in her tower for her heckin safety so that her people don't find out she's a powerless no good worthless ruler because one of the other things you find out is that the power of the ruler helps and maintains the power of her people to the point where if you kill the ruler and there is no heir the entire civilization dies so like if if somebody acts as isla all the wildlings are dead goodbye gone farewell the wildling people are also just not doing that great the economy of hearts is tough everyone hates them this is this is my problem okay we get to talk about this now she's a fucking wildling so one of the things because she doesn't have powers she doesn't have to eat hearts you don't find this out at this point i'll let you know when you find it out in the book so you think she eats hearts but i'm sitting there and i'm like how often are we eating hearts, guys? How many people are there? How many humans? Because the thing is, that's a lot of meat to waste for one heart. Fair point. Like, that would be like getting a whole ass cow and being like, I just want the tenderloin. Fuck everything else. Just the tenderloin, please. And like, one heart feel it feeds one wildling. So it's like, a whole ass human is dead. And they make a point that... Uh, there are gems and jewels and rubies and shit just growing out of the ground in the wildling new realms and that greedy humans come to steal them and those are the ones they kill and that's how they get <laughs> their hearts. But like, what if it's just a poor human who's like, there's gems on the ground, nobody <laughs> is doing anything with them, my family's starving. Because they, they give the implication that it's bad people that it's only bad people's hearts that they eat. So here's the thing. This is where it goes back to it being middle school world building because she's basically like, oh, it would be cool if they did this and that. And then she didn't really think through the implications in ways that could actually be kind of interesting. 
if they're rich, maybe there's a slave trade with the other um, continents or the other people who are like, hey, you know what? Let's give them our poor people for money. And so that's kind of makes them complicit in it. Or maybe there's a sect of wildlings who are like, no, I'm going to eat all of the human because I don't want to waste them you know, even though they don't necessarily have to. Or maybe it's something like the meat industry now where most people just like, you know, there's a few hunters who kill all the people, but everybody else is like, oh, we just get hearts. It's cool. Like, so there's interesting things that actually could be done even with that kind of ridiculous of a premise. Um, but no, none of those things are done. Just a side comment about the humans that come to steal the giant drums that are just growing in the forest on the ground that nobody, the wildlings don't give a shit about. They sometimes use it to decorate their clothing, but like they don't really hold it a value. Those are the people they're killing, which is like, I don't think you thought through those implications, Aster. Because <laughs> that doesn't sound like a criminal. That just sounds like, holy shit, there's a diamond growing out of the ground. I'm going to take it like... Bitch, I'd probably do it if I didn't know, if I didn't know, <laughs> and there was just an entire patch of diamonds, and there was no sign that said, wildling property, please hands off, like, fuck it, I'd be dead, they'd be eating my heart. Even if you're a robber, or even if you're a bad person, do you deserve to die for it? Like, it's a weird thing to, like, excuse this economy of hearts. I would have preferred if it was just a, a, a skosh more animalistic and they didn't try to justify it by being like, it is the bad people who try to steal our gems. Or even if it was just limited to people they fall in love with that you need to eat the hearts of, I think that's a more reasonable, like, okay. And then it would have unified those two things that are very separate. <laughs> like, you have to eat hearts <laughs> and kill your lovers. You have to eat your lovers up. Like, whoa. I do like the dark room sex orgy idea, though, by the way. That is brilliant. Isn't uh, it? It's such a good way to deal stuff. with that while still maintaining a healthy population. There's a, a chapter of setup where Isla is, like, talking with her guardians. And she's, like, super sword trained and stuff, which, like, uh, it felt a little mood to schooly. Again, a little Mary Sue-ish, but, like, whatever. And it also does not make sense in relation to what you find out their goal was for her. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, Poppy and Tara seem like perfectly lovely individuals. You don't get enough of them or their personalities or their relationship for you to care about stuff that happens towards the end of the book. Oh, is there a twist towards the end that recontextualizes okay. all of this in a way that oh, doesn't really man. make sense? There is, and it's part of the reason. So let me say something. The beginning of this book and the end of this book are the worst parts. So a lot of people who just went in and read the beginning... I can understand why you thought this book was absolute hot flame and garbage. Uh, the end really soured me. There was this whole middle period where I was like, you know, I'm not having a great time, but I'm not having a terrible time. The plot is moving quickly. There's some character stuff going on. This is not my thing, but it's not horrid. And then the ending, I was just like, well, first there was a sex scene and I immediately was like, throw it away. <laughs> throw it away. I hate it. We just finished ranking all the books for our one year anniversary. And uh, this definitely goes in the no thanks uh, tier. A hundred percent no thanks. If I ever have to hear this audiobook actress ever again say, I'm burning for you. Like, I will murder myself. Anyway, anyway, anyway. So Isla has to talk to her people and be like, I, your ruler, shall go to the centennial and fight to free us of this curse, my people. Except, you know, like a teenage girl who's like 20 something, not teenage. She's like early 20s. As you can tell, Maria is just a really talented voice actress who's yes. just waiting for the big break. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If anyone would like to hire me. Please submit your application. It's actually funny going back to our first couple videos where I made fun of you every time you did a voice. And like now that's a staple of the whole videos. <laughs> yeah, it is. And you know what's funny? With the ampersand one, I thought I was doing a pretty good interpretation of the ampersand. Again, at the time, I was just like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I didn't know that's how you told stories. <laughs> this this podcast has been enlightening about all of us so she does the thing and then her people are like remember the plan Tara and Poppy are like remember our plan for the centennial and then she's like I'm not doing that plan at all I'm doing a different one and you're like oh, oh, oh how are we doing this so she has to walk through a portal she she comes out of the portal and a tall blue haired dude or like gray hair I forgot but there's this dude named Azul and then this like dark moody like in black clothing guys appear and his name is Grimshaw <laughs> who goes by the name Grim guys if you didn't know this this was our sad uh, bad boy but with a good hard romantic interest oh my gosh he's so stereotypical and like 
he just flirts with her all the time in this like bad boy way. He's snarky. It's just, and also the revelation you get at the end just makes the beginning of this just so even worse. Cause you're like, what are you doing, buddy? Like you literally have a plan. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Anyway, she meets like the moonling ruler. So Azul is the, the skyling ruler. She meets the moonling ruler. Who's this tall white haired, very severe lady named Cleo. And then like this young, the, the youngest of them, the starling ruler pops through the portal. Everyone is very like vaguely polite introducing themselves and then they like go down into palace itself and what you discover <laughs> is that all of these people used to kind of live like all the rulers used to live around Lightlark. Because Lightlark is a collection of islands and there's like the main island and then there was a bunch of isles and each group of people had an isle so like there was the wildling isle there was sky isle there was sun isle and moon I, like guys <laughs> aster please i can help i promise the one ruler who still lives here is the ruler of the sunlings but he is a origin i think was the term she used he it's a ruler who has multiple powers from multiple groups so for instance aro is the sun isle king but he's also the king of light lark so he's technically in charge of everyone one thing we should mention is that four out of the six rulers are like have been around since the curses aro grimshaw this light one and cleo again who's like why you would name one of your villains cleo i don't know but yeah they've been around since like the the original founding minimum like 550 years old minimum that's the youngest they can possibly be Potentially, like, I'm pretty sure Azul and Cleo are a bit older. I'm pretty sure Aro and Grimshaw are a little bit younger. But anyway, Aro can use Sunling powers, he can use Skyling powers, he can use Starling powers, and he can use Moonling powers. The only powers he can't use are Wildling and Nightshade. Never explained. <laughs> Never addressed. Don't ask. You're not going to get an answer. Don't worry about it. Also, I must have not been paying attention because Aro, for literally half the book, I thought was about 40 to 15 years old, which is going to make a part later very funny. For some reason, I just thought he was old and he's not. He, I mean, he is old, but he looks young. I also went in thinking he was going to be like the old wizened king ruler. More like uh, the, I, I originally had vibes like the guy from Rohan, the ruler, the king of Rohan. Theoden. Theoden. Yes. Thank you. And he's not. He's hot. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> Just file that away in your brain. <laughs> you might be picking up why we're mentioning that now, but just remember, Aro is hot. Grumpy, but hot. Anyway, so they get there. There's rules to the centennial. The basic rules are the rulers must unite. The original fa offense must be done again. One of the kings has to be killed. Yeah, one of the rulers and their entire realm has to die, and that'll break the curses. So there's like a couple, like number one, unification original offense needs to be done again and then like you gotta kill someone <laughs> and so step one of the centennial that they think is bringing all the rulers to light lark to try think of something that's the unifying portion and since one of the realms and the rulers has to die it used to be during the centennial the real free for all you could just start killing anyone anyway but they have a rule now you can't kill anyone until day 50 of the tournament before that everybody has to be civil there's this whole portion where you have to like do displays of strength like in the first like 25 days like it's a bunch of trials where like a ruler will do it they come up with their own challenge whoever wins the most challenges gets to sort everybody into partnerships and you can't kill your partner so it's kind of a powerful position to be in it's night one everybody's just arrived you think our girl isla doesn't know anyone but she gets to her room and then there's a knock on her door and the starling ruler celeste is there and they hug and squeal and bounce around and i was a little confused at first i was like listen you just met her but then you realize oh no because of her star stick and her ability to bounce around different places. I, I, I think there should be a dildo called the Star Stick. <laughs> like the whole time, that was the only thing I was able to think of is like, well, I get more, does she use the Star Stick for other things? Okay. It's just, it's awkward that it's called a stick. And it's literally just a stick. Like we couldn't, anyway, I'm, I'm, we've got to put the naming conventions <laughs> to bed at some point. And you find out that her and Celeste have actually been best friends for years. Several years ago, after she first found her star stick in one of her mother's like wardrobes, she 
poofed around to different places and ended up in the Starling realm. And she met Celeste, who is the young, younger than 25 year old ruler of the Starling people. And they form a friendship because they're the two youngest rulers and the two realms that could be targeted as ones that would be easy to kill and get rid of. So they band together. They make a friendship, bestest, bestest friends, sleepover vibes. It's a little uh, uh, like it, do- it doesn't feel very realistic. It feels like, OK, they transported a modern friend girl friendship to the past but like whatever i get it it's described as having that level of intensity that you had with like your high school best friends where you guys were like we're gonna be best friends forever and like that just that intense young devotion to each other unfortunately we never actually see their friendship it's never really portrayed to us they interact very rarely throughout this book and we never got a clear picture of what their friendship was like prior to the start of this tournament. So once again, there's a female friendship badly presented <laughs> and thus the emotional payout we should get later on when something happens is very fucking low. And Celeste is like, remember our plan. And it is at this point that you learn that her guardian's plan, Tara and Poppy, was for her to seduce King Aro. By seducing him? And getting him to fall in love with her, that would keep her from being the one that gets killed. And then when he fell in love with her, because here's another really weird fucking thing. That this, <laughs> it's, it's another piece of really weird world building that I don't like. If you fall in love with someone, they can get access to your powers. It's not like they have to make a pact, like enduring, like you two can choose to share powers. No, if someone falls in love with you, you have access to their powers. Like, that's it. It's done. And it, originally I thought there was like a ritual you had to do to allow this to happen. And it was a choice you had to make. But nah. Nope, 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 nope. You could just fall. You you are in love and then you can do it. And I, I can't remember if it's you both have to be in love or only one no, of you has to be in love. No, just one way. Just one way. So uh, all of you who like, you know, have a loved one, spouse, partner of some type. But also, like, you don't always agree with their decisions. And, you know, sometimes they're a little bit tempestuous, maybe. Or, you know, you don't necessarily like all the things they do. Too bad. They now have all of your powers. So it's if they are in love with you, you get their powers. Uh, If you are in love with them, they get your powers. So ideally, you're both in love and you both have the same powers. Ideally, you form a harem with the other uh, four other nations powers. And then you have all the powers combined and are an avatar. No. (laughs) <laughs> no <laughs> romances between rulers are considered heckin bad ideas because you don't want to be given people with powers left right and center their plan because again isla has no powers is she gets the king to fall in love with her then she gets the king pa- the king's powers and that's a way to disguise the fact that she doesn't have powers never mind the fact that the king's powers don't look anything like wildling powers at all (laughs) he can like burn stuff and make fire and keep things warm that ain't that ain't controlling plants and druidy shit so i don't know anyway she decides that's a heck heck and bad plan her and celeste and so they go instead to find a object called the bond breaker that apparently these two found about in a book that the bond breaker is a magical object that will let you break a bond and in this case they consider curses a bond though a bond is something two people have to enter in willingly so i did not think this kind of vibed with that because like i it would imply that the people were like yes we'll take the curses please but <laughs> they weren't so it's not really about anyway but ideally this bond breaker needs like 20 like needs a gallon of blood and so they're plan is to split the gallon between the two of them so they both surprise survive and then it'll get rid of the courses curses on both of their realms and then isla would have powers because the reason isla doesn't have powers i forgot to mention this her mother fell in love with someone but then somehow didn't kill that person was able to birth isla and because she hadn't done her part of the bargain of like killing someone isla was born without powers and if you're thinking <laughs> That feels not like it's working with an inherent logic in the world. You're right. It's not. Welcome to this book. Anyway, but that's that's (laughs) the excuse you're given. By breaking the curse, in their theory, it would allow Isla to have wildling powers because it would negate the fact that her mother didn't kill her father. 
Also, I guess her father ended up killing her mother. I don't know. All of that is then retconned later to be something else. So it's like, okay, I... There's a lot of this book that like is backstory that like is kind of hard to remember. And it was hard for Maria to remember. So it's not just me. And it's also because they retcon it, it makes it very hard. Because one of the ways I remember things throughout books is it gets repeated a lot. So like if it is only mentioned in the beginning, uh, but not explicitly referred to again, it makes it very hard to remember it. And this book, because it retcons backstory stuff, it muddies the waters. Start of the tournament. I'm not going to go through all the challenges. Basically, each challenge is one of the rulers is told, hey, you got to do your challenge now. And they get to pick the competition and everybody has to do it. So for example, the very first one, I don't know, Isaac goes shopping at first. She ends up talking to Grimm and he basically tells her my challenge is going to be first first and it's sword fighting and this is a good tip for her because she needs to go get a sword because she didn't bring one even though she has a ton there's literally a point where where she has a wall of swords and you didn't bring a goddamn one and it's also weird that the palace doesn't just provide you one like as like a suite of things ready for the challenge you would think, but no, she goes shopping. It's funny because Grimm at this point is like, he's bad boy, but he's not really bad boy enough for him to be a bad boy. It, it's a very odd mix. Like, there's not a lot of tension between them, really. Like, he's just goth. Yeah, and not even, like, goth goth. He's, like, <laughs> what people think goth is, like, in media. Like, mm-hmm. No, it's totally true. Or, like, a character from, what is that vampire series with the werewolf it, he he looks very underworld those are the vibes he's got so that's about it we don't know does he and and the only thing is his powers are the powers of darkness like besides that you don't know why this guy's that bad you you don't like what did he do is he a bad boy it's just assumed he's a bad boy also i have to mention when she first sees him she looks at him and goes do i know you and then he's like, no, we've never met before. And you're like, that was a weird thing to say, Isla. <laughs> Why? What? She ends up chatting with Grimm and he's like, my challenge is first and it's going to be sword fighting. So she goes, she beats Grimm, even though she's not supposed to. Her and Celeste decided that they were going to be middle of the pack. So nobody would think of them as a threat. Nobody would be like, they wouldn't be super terrible, like not immediate options for killing, but not someone you had to compete against. And Isla immediately just doesn't do that. <laughs> Justify King Aro. Uh, that's the last challenger. And like she almost beats him and then chooses not to, but everybody kind of can tell. And so like now they're like, wow, she's stupid good at sword fighting for some reason. Internal logic of the book says she's really good at sword fighting because she doesn't have powers. So her caretaker, Taro, wanted her to be as prepared as possible and was straight up abusive from some of the stuff she's like mentions her doing and you're like oh my god that was a turn i completely get having to like be really good at sword fighting hand-to-hand combat like you know using uh things that look like jewelry as weapons and that kind of stuff i do not understand this survivalist training you get so many montages where tara had her like hang from a tree for five hours and she wasn't allowed to let go or like just abandoned her in the middle of like a forest and she had to find her way back kind of dead and sick and like it just doesn't make sense like why what in what what do you imagine her future or the centennial is going to be like that you think especially once we get the plot twist at the end that you think she's going to have to do any of this shit like it's a little bit like, I just want my character to be like a badass ninja. And like, okay. Also, Isla is supposed to be very perceptive because she's had to like always be able to read people. But that doesn't really make a lot of sense with her backstory of being sheltered. So it's another case where like the character that the author wanted to write and their backstory don't really match up. But basically, the challenges are not the important part. The important part is that her and Celeste are sneaking around looking for a library to find the bond breaker each of the libraries is magically like you can get to all of the libraries but to get to the hidden part of each of the libraries you have to have some power from that realm and so they don't obviously have power from all the realms so like the first thing celeste does is check the starling library it's not there so then they have to go to the skyling library isla has to like dye her hair blue so she looks like a skyling and wear blue clothing because everybody wears clothing the color <laughs> like all the sunlings have to wear gold guys it must be super tiring celeste has to make and why this wasn't immediately a red flag for isla 
Isla, I will never understand, to get the powers of the other rulers, they have to make these terrible shitty gloves, which are from the skin <laughs> of a human that it, they then imbue with traces of power from other rulers. And so number one, Celeste has to go find a human. Celeste has to, you assume at the start, find someone to skin the human, then make gloves out of the human leather. Which is just weirdly hardcore. Eventually, uh, when Celeste's like, I've got the gloves, uh, Isla is like, where'd you? And she was like, don't worry. It was a really, I was insured that it was a really shitty human. And you're like, <laughs> okay. And uh, basically how they get the powers from the other rulers is in Celeste's thing, all of them have to touch a mirror. So a bunch of their, uh, some of their, enough of their magic is imbued into the mirror that they can then just touch the gloves on the mirror and it sucks in the other ruler's powers. So Isla looks through the libraries. No, she's not finding stuff. She gets to a bunch of them. While this is happening, her and Grimm are doing a heckin' flirty McFlirt flirt. Things are happening. He takes her t for chocolate. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, that was so weird. <laughs> like out of nowhere, she's going clothing shopping and weapons shopping and he's like, you want to go get some chocolate? And you're like, okay. And then they go and they just eat a fuck ton of chocolate. Again, it's weird because the setting is supposed to be kind of medieval at times, you get the sense, but then at other times there's just very modern stuff in there. And again, it's like he's a bad boy, but not really. He loves chocolate. <laughs> Relatable. <laughs> um, anyway, and you, you discovered while she's in the castle that she doesn't actually eat hearts, but Aro kind of almost forces her to eat a heart in front of everyone where he's like, no, he has your heart. And she was like, I prefer to eat in private. And she actually has to eat a piece before like Grimm helps her out and sends He's like, nah, let her eat it in her room. <laughs> Everybody else eat. And like, Aro the king is somehow okay with that anyway. So like, she ends up breaking into the Moonling library and it is like, it does not go well. It, it, it does not. She like fucks shit up. They kind of see her. After this point, Cleo, the king of the, the queen of the Moonling realm is like, I'm gonna fuck you up and attempts to kill her. Her and Grimm are bonding. But eventually after the 25 days, Aro is declared the winner of the trials and how he wins. This is his challenge was the last one. And his is like, he tells them it's a tea party. And then it turns out they drank truth serum. And like in all of their cups, their greatest secret is spelled out. And whoever is willing to share their greatest secret will, wins the challenge. And so Aro, it gets to Aro and he's like, I'm dying. And they're like, what the fuck? And it turns out, Aro's one arm is turning gray and lifeless and Lightlark is dying. And this centennial is super important because he is literally losing power, which means Lightlark as a whole, which is literally held together by his power, will fall the fuck apart. Um, and they're like, oh shit, this might be the last centennial we have to try break the curses. Aro wins. Aro gets to sort people into their pairings and he sorts himself and Isla together, and then uh, Celeste and Cleo are together. And again, you get very little of Celeste throughout this whole thing, partially because like they can't let anyone know that they know each other. It's also worth pointing out that, again, it's not like they have a relationship where it feels like it's between two rulers or where it's between like two equals. It's literally just like gal pal pajama party kind of feeling. She has to start working with Aro and she, her and Aro don't get along. They argue lots of snipping back and forth. And basically Aro is like, listen, I made you my partner because I need your help. And I need Wildlings help specifically. And what you discover is that Aro's plan. So again, her and Celeste are looking for the bond breaker. And again, okay, so let me talk about why I hate this <laughs> bond breaker thing so the fuck much. Number one, if there was a bond breaker, and this is me talking to Isla. Because you eventually discover, like, at first I thought this bond breaker thing was in earnest, but surprise, it's not a bond breaker. It's a bond maker. We'll get there. Don't worry. But it's just, it's so dumb. Isla, if there was a magical item that could break bonds and curses that Celeste found out about in a book, in what world would you assume only she would have a copy of the book? that had this information. And it's not like she's like, this was an old starling relic that nobody else has laid eyes on in 500 years. And, you know, starlings keep dying at the age of 25. So nobody has really looked here in a while. Like, you're telling me there's just a relic sitting in a <laughs> library that would solve all of the fucking curses and nobody's fucking... And she's also told no one about it. 
is also the weird part why you would not get the other kings in on it so that none of them have to die is kind of an odd decision yeah because also like if if it only needs a gallon of blood if you split it six ways that's way less blood from each of you and because like at first you're like can you only split it two ways but then they decide they're gonna split it three ways why could you not have just so just it makes no sense it's a dumbass fucking like and it just (laughs) within the logic of the world all of these kingdoms have giant fucking libraries with hidden parts that have magical also what was in the room which room the locked closet in the wildling palace nothing we never anyway sorry so i just remembered that there was a, a plot point that never got seen i just i hate the bond breaker plot so much it's so fucking dumb and it just it really like luckily celeste eventually isla is like yeah no this bond breaker is probably not a thing and i'm so thankful for that because it just feels like such a dumb plot line and i much prefer the plot line that ends up actually happening which is aro's plan where he's like we have to find the heart of light and what you learn is that Lightlark was created. And Grimm gives her this first bit of, bit of information. Lightlark, uh, everyone just assumes that the Sunlings, specifically Aro's ancestors, made Lightlark, um, crafted it and is holding it together. But it was actually made, what Grimm tells her, between a knight, the old knight shady ruler and the Sunling ruler. And they came together and they made Lightlark. The heart of all of its power is this thing called the heart of Lightlark. Originally, everyone assumes that Aro is like the power source of Lightlark, but what you find out is he's just the channel by which the power from the heart of Lightlark gets through to the king, like the land, which is a weird way. I would assume it would go from heart to land to king, but you know, whatever, it's fine. What do you know? What do you know about this magic system? What do I, I know nothing. I don't, I don't know. And I literally know <laughs> fucking nothing. <laughs> he basically says that it blooms every 100 years during the centennial. And he says blooms because apparently it like attaches itself to plants and they assume it's like a flower. Which is why he wanted a wildling to help him. Yes, to find it. Uh, surprise, she has no powers. And she weirdly gets away with this because he's like, you need to disguise your wildling powers because there are ancient creatures here that would kill you. And she's like, I'll disguise them. <laughs> Don't you <laughs> So they start looking, and the thing is that they're kind of like being a little snarky back and forth. They're going through the forest. And again, at this point, I thought he was 40 to 50 years old looking. And so them like kind of being snarky with each other, I thought was like, oh, is this going to be like a cute father daughter thing? Uh, No, he's hot, guys. I just didn't realize it at the time. So this is the beginning of the second leg of our love triangle. And I will say... I've talked before about how much I hate fever touch. No real fever touch between the two of them, which I appreciated. There were parts where like he was healing her and his hands were warm. But again, at this point, I thought he was 40. (laughs) And it's not. (laughs) His hands hands are always warm, just like Grimm's hands are always freezing fucking cold. But even if I had known, there's no real fever touch. It's not framed that way. So I actually did appreciate that. So kudos, book. And so like they're doing all sorts of explorations. They're doing things. They're bonding as it's going. In the beginning, they were really like sour to each other, but they eventually warm up. But during this period, she notices Grimm has suddenly disappeared. He kept showing up. He kept like being around and putting himself in her path and she's like and now you just decided to stop like that's kind of and she feels kind of used like maybe he he was using her for information or for a plan that he had and so she's kind of mad at him but she doesn't like she's not like I was falling for him and and now he just kicked me to the curb she was just like "Mm." Like, like she hasn't fully contemplated her feelings. And at this point, she informs the reader through narration that she has never done nothing. She is a virgin. She she's, she doesn't know much about her, like, body. Even though wildlings are supposed to be, like, super slutty all the time. Yeah, even though they're literally, like, supposed to be, like, sexually liberated, uh, she has not done any of that. Partially because she's seen very little men <laughs> in her life. And apparently women, not her thing. So they're searching through the forest. One thing that does happen is, again, this book gets weirdly metal at times. Like at one point she gets caught by a tree and the tree is like digging thorns into her. And Giant when... spiky, like spiked. Like as it goes in, it's spiked. But then if you pull it out, it's they're spiked this way. So it's... <laughs> yeah, it's barbed. And like... She and and uh, the king have to like pull them out, and she's describing screaming, and the pain is like incandescently high, and like it's like 
weirdly violent for a book that otherwise is tonally like a middle school book. So like that's one of the things about this book that again is just sort of odd. There's also like a scene where um, after she breaks into the Moonling Library and Cleo's decided she's a threat. There's a scene where the a bunch of oh god I hated this oh I'm so glad I remembered to talk <laughs> about this oh my god she is going to buy a dagger and she's meeting Celeste and they're supposed to because like she didn't bring daggers with her so a lot of the time she's literally just left using like her bracelet that oh she has a bunch of like a bracelet which could be a dagger or earrings that are throwing stars a choker that could be a dagger and i'm like none of these things really make sense as weapons like it's hard to hide those things but okay earring throwing stars i'll give you but everything else i'm like eh. but anyway so she needs to go and so her and celeste are planning to pretend like they bumped up like they just happened to bump into each other in this uh like store but while she's there a random starling appears and gives her a note that says your life is in grave danger and then the starling runs off and isla being isla is like wait come back tell me more and so she just starts running after the starling running after the starling and it takes her to like an abandoned place on the like beach with like a ship and then there's a bunch of moonling nobles How do you know they're Moonling Nobles? They are dressed like Moonling Nobles. (laughs) Moonling Nobles where Cleo, the queen, is not technically allowed to kill Isla herself. But she has implied to her nobles that she would like Isla dead. And the nobles, instead of doing the logical thing and hiring people from not the Moonling realm to murder Isla, decide, you know what? The seven of us. We seven noble lords. Not at all recognizable in our clothing. They're not disguised. It's not like they they tried to powder their hair blue and look like skylings or like put on peasant clothes. It's not even like one of them may be like, okay, you know, uh, wildling loves me so I can use my wildling powers instead of my moonling powers to kill him. And people are like, oh, she died because of a wildling because there's like a giant vine in her heart. No. And so she immediately sees them and is like, Cleo. And, And her and Celeste murdered the fuck out of these men (laughs) just decimate now granted they were actively trying to kill her but like they murder them and then celeste is like this was we have to leave her a message she needs to know that she can't fuck with you so in the blood of these seven six to seven mooning nobles they write try harder number one no noble would have gone and done this seven Maybe one who was really good at stuff and, like, could disguise himself. But seven, like, like they had all just been in the, like, cigar shop smoking, having a a (laughs) boys day. And then they went, you know what? Queen Cleo decided she didn't want that. You know, fuck that Isla bitch. We're going to go kill her right the fuck now. We're going to hire a starling woman to bring her to us. But then our plans of subterfuge end there and we're just going to expose ourselves like it's the, one of the dumbest things that happens in this book what it shows me is something that where i don't think aster is a terrible writer or a bad writer and i think that potentially as she writes more she will get better but what it tells me is she does not know how politics works or or, or like espionage or like plotting it's it's got none of the grace of a well-laid uh, Jacqueline Carey. Ah, uh, yes, our queen. But here's the thing. It doesn't need to be, like, no, it's, it's hard to get to Jacqueline Carey's level. You know, like, praise the queen. Very hard. Um, but some common sense, like, have you watched Game of Thrones? <laughs> or any historical drama? Again, it's like this first level, I thought of this cool idea, but then I'm not actually going to think about the implications of it or how any of this works. It's interesting because this is like the fifth book where the author wanted to write a political storyline, but like political storylines are so much harder than straightforward action adventure that like, maybe you shouldn't, maybe you shouldn't write that if you're not good at it. No one in the book, like after this point is like, oh my God, who's murdering these nobles? Like it's never mentioned again. There should be. You have just killed not a seven, six to seven moonling noblemen. Their families blood feud we are in a blood feud right now that is seven grieving wives or husbands because there are uh like uh same-sex couples in this universe grieving wives or husbands that are now hating you this is a massive massive political uh problem 
Like this is a massive, uh, po- this is a massive diplomatic issue because again, how would they believe that they were coming to kill her? Like, you know what I mean? Like their families would be like, no, you just murdered them. There's no proof that they were trying to kill you. Yeah. Or even that they were missing or it's so weird. And there's no fallout except that Cleo gets like more pissed off at her. Weird decision. But anyway, she's getting to know Aro more. That stuff is happening. She eventually confronts Grimm and is like, why have you been avoiding me? And he was like, it was for the best that I stay away. And she was like, can I not trust you? And she's, he's like, you shouldn't. And you're like... God, can you two just, like, get a room? Like, just bone already, but, like, off the page. So they start hanging out again. She's seeing, like, Aro and doing stuff. Eventually, her and Grimm and go on, like, a weird, like, adventure where he shows her his powers. And they're, like, Doc and... Like, he could decimate Lightlark in an instant. Like He could, like, open a black hole. And essentially, also, you figure out that he was the one who led the armies against Lightlark before the curses. And so, like, that's why him and Aro are, like, at odds all the time. There was a giant war between Lightlark and the Nightshade Realms prior to the curses. And it was, like, his father and uh, Grimm's father was, like, the guy fighting against Aro's dad and that. Or I guess Aro's brother was the one who was in charge of that. Point. So we end up finding out a lot about like what was going on later with that generation. But to me, it felt like a really poor version of what was going on in Harrow the Ninth, where like there's all these old feuds going on. And like in that book, they make sense. And in this book, you're just like, I don't know who these people are and I don't super care. Eventually, they keep looking for places on the island and they keep finding like the book isn't the heart isn't there. The heart isn't there. And then eventually they start like really bonding and talking, like legitimately talking and sharing stuff. And eventually they they do like they play 20 questions. We're like, (laughs) I ask a question, then you get to ask a question. We both have to answer honestly. And at one point she asks him, what is his? Each of the rulers have a power that is not related to their actual realms powers. So they call it a flare. And she's like, what's your flare? And he's like, I'll tell you if you tell me what was in like your cups, like what was your secret? And she's like, no, I won't do that. And then he's like, how about this? If we find the heart and you tell me your secret, I will let you be the winner of the centennial. And the winner of the centennial gets a massive amount of power. Like not only do they win and get to break the curses, but they get a ton of power and it would really help the uh wildling realm which is not doing too good and she's like oh man that's that's a." and at first she's like no i can't do it i won't do it and then something happens and she finds out like tara is dying and turning into like a root yeah when wildlings die sometimes they turn into trees she has this whole moment where she's like you know what i want like i to help the people i love i need to you know sacrifice bits of myself so she goes to aro and she goes okay My secret is I don't have any powers and I want to be the winner of the centennial. And he's like, straight, that's fine. And he's like, and at one point she, she calls him out on like lying and he's like, oh no, I've never lied for you, lied to you. And you find out his flair is he can tell when people are lying. So he has known that she's been lying like 80% of the time they've been together. After she tells Aro that her power, she doesn't have any powers that like, A couple days later, he calls a big meeting and he goes, I've decided I'd like to switch partners. I'd like to be with Cleo. Isla's going to be with Grimshaw. And also everybody in Isla doesn't have any powers. And Isla (laughs) is like, holy shit, you goddamn piece of shit. And she's super mad. Celeste is like, it's okay. You know, I told you. Fuck that guy. And also like, why did you tell him? And then Grim is like, no. And, And he's comforting. And you basically find out at some point that Grim knew she didn't have powers since the moment she like appeared because for some reason he can tell that her and Grimm start getting real like uh familiar and basically Isla at this point uh thinks Cleo is the one who cast the spells she was like gonna talk to someone who was gonna tell her who cast the spells but then that guy ended up getting killed and she thinks it's Cleo um and her and Grimm like get soaked in the rain and there's like baby sexy times in a church like 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 not sexy times but tensiony times in a church once everybody finds out she doesn't have powers grim moves her into wild isle and the place of mirrors which is literally a castle made of mirrors <laughs> again naming conventions we don't got it 
place of mirrors. And they discovered the place of mirrors earlier. Like Grimm was like, do you want me to show you the, like, cause Ara wouldn't take her to the wild Isle and she couldn't find it. And she mentioned this to Grimm and Grimm took her and showed her the place of mirrors. And one of the things she learns about the place of mirrors is that inside the place of mirrors, only wildling magic will work, not uh, any others. So it's, it's very safe. But while she's there, she like pokes around one night and she finds in one of the cupboards a doorway that looks very similar to the cupboard in the door in the cupboard of her mother's bedroom where she found the star stick and she's like oh there must be something really important in there like really important and you at first you're like oh maybe that's where the bond breaker is or oh maybe that's where the heart is and she's like trying to find the key but it's a weird like it doesn't look like a keyhole and she can't find anything and she's like i'll try this lamp I'll try this shoe. Like she's just putting <laughs> things that obviously wouldn't fit. It's an adventure game, basically. Like you know how in adventure games they have like this weird dream logic of what thing goes to the other. So it's you always just whatever's in your inventory, you drag a click over to the part of the environment you want changed. It's that, but in a book. Yeah, and none of it works. And she's like, "Rats! I feel like something is important there, and it's 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 important." And you, as the reader, are like, "Wow, it must be really important." You never find out. It never is ex- <laughs> like it doesn't happen in this book, and it might happen in like the second book, but it sure as fuck doesn't happen here. And it's just a weird thing to set up from so soon in this book. Like if it was something that was set up at the end of the first book, like sure, whatevs. When Aro's like, everybody, she doesn't have powers. Grimm moves her into the um, wild, like the place of mirrors and is basically like, hey, I I want to take care of you. Here's, here's a necklace. If you wear it and you pull it, I will come and I will save you. And she's like, but then everybody will know we're working together. So he makes it invisible because that's another one of his powers. Celeste is going to protect her. Grim is going to protect her. So she feels less bad about losing Aro's protection. There's a big party that's happening on the day that everybody can start killing each other. Like at midnight, everybody can start trying to kill each other. And she has to go to this event because it's one of the rules. And she goes and she's in like a cool dress. Her and Grim go off to do like romantic things. That's actually when he gives her the necklace. They go back to the party and he's like, you should go dance with Aro. And she was like, that was a weird thing for you to say after we just had a moment, buddy. But she like her and Celeste are doing something and then all of a sudden Aro like doubles over in pain clutching himself the the entire ballroom just collapses in on itself fissures open in the earth and basically nobody did this it's just light lark falling apart it is the castle falling apart it is proof that Aro is failing and uh she kind of like has to like save him from falling in but eventually like she is following like when Aro and Cleo are teaming up she's like they're gonna get the heart and then like if Cleo gets the heart it's gonna be bad she follows uh Cleo onto Moonling Isle the bird spots her and squawks at her Cleo captures her and attaches her to a uh icicle thing and encases her in ice so she can't pull her pendant to get help from what's his face these like men come and are gonna like eat her like they find her attached to this like ice wall and they're like ah yes she she will be delicious we shall eat her um and she's like freezing to death and about to get eaten and then she feels fire and warmth and Aro has come and he has saved her and she's like fuck you you betrayed me he's like no listen and basically he says he realized that because they looked everywhere else that the heart had to be on moon isle and the only way they were gonna, he was going to be able to search moon isle was if cleo trusted him and the only way for cleo to trust him is if he publicly embarrassed isla because cleo doesn't like isla and he needed isla to not know about it so that she would react genuinely and be hurt and super fucking angry about it and he was like so i had to do it and she's like fuck you you should have told me meh, meh, meh. but they end up being like he was like i do still want to work with you our pact is still on let's go look for the heart um and so they go looking they swim in some icy water a mermaid nearly gets her they check somewhere else and they can't find it they just they're not finding it and then eventually they haven't there's another party like a festival thing that happens she drinks some weird wine she gets real fucking drunk and uh loosey goosey and aro is like let me take you to your room you are a threat to yourself and others and they start talking and she starts asking him like a lot of questions eventually like she wakes up and she comes to and she's like less drunk and she was asleep in his lap one thing i have to say is that the development of the romance between them 
is kind of nice. It is. It's not horrible. It's not horrible. Even once I realized that he wasn't 40 or 50 year old looking. Because <laughs> again, at certain points I was like, oh, this is actually kind of, maybe they're going for like a mother or father or daughter type of thing. Um, and then I realized again, he's hot. But yeah, it's a slow burn, which both me and Maria are stands of. There's no fever touch, which is really nice. There's not a ton of chemistry, but there is like a little bit. Like again, it, there's, it's like, okay, maybe they're getting somewhere with Compared this. to her and Grimm, way better. For the longest time, I couldn't figure out why she hadn't swapped the roles between Aro and Grimm. Because Aro was a way better fit. Yeah, like he is actually, it reminds me a bit, obviously nowhere near, obviously, but a little bit of Uprooted. Where, you know, Sarkon and... Uh, old grumpy man. And, it, like, she's spending a lot of time with him. So I'm like, why is this old man... She doing this with this old man and not with Grimshaw? And then I figured out that, yeah. <laughs> what was going on? Yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> she basically realizes, like, oh, it has to be during... Because the, the clue they had was it was a place where light and dark mix. That is where you're going to find the thing. And eventually she realizes, and neither of them thought of this before. Don't ask me why. That it's not just a place where light and darkness meet. It's a time. Dusk or dawn is when they'll find it. Prior to them having this revelation, though, her and Grimshaw get jiggy with it. And, <laughs> like, it's not, like, nothing happens with him. It's all focused on her, but I hated it. So he does, like, a love confession, and he's like, you've ruined me. Since the moment I saw you, you've ruined <laughs> so me. so bad. And I just, I was in the car, and I was like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> like I inwardly was like, oh, I almost texted Maria the line because I was just like, this is so it's bad. It's so cringy. It's so will flash up the picture I sent you as I was driving <laughs> while while I was listening to this portion of it. Please, just just right here. And I don't know what because we've read some terrible sex scenes, um, but like this one was just so ugh. It was just it was very cloying. Like it was trying to be like super sweet and passionate, but like it wasn't earned enough i felt and it was just like i'm burning for you i have burned for you every moment and she's like every moment <laughs> uh, and you're like oh i don't like it and then so like he does a, a, a thing for her she very much enjoys it and then it is at a point after this that her and aro are like we're gonna go find the hot actually i think it they have sex after it, where like they do the thing after but anyway her and aro go to find the heart um, they basically discover, uh, we're going to try dawn, like night or day. And she also realizes the bird that they assumed was Cleo's spy. Every time they go into the moonling realm, yells at them and is like very insistently yelling. And she's like, what if the bird's trying to show us where the heart is? So they decide they're going to go to the moonling lands. They're going to follow the bird and they're going to wait for dawn or dusk. And so they, they wait for dawn. They, it's at on so they, they go out they, they go to the bird takes them to this tree the bird sits in its little happy nest and they're like okay and as dawn breaks a an egg appears floating underneath the bird's nest not in the bird's <laughs> nest like all of a sudden the bird moves and there's a golden glowing egg in the nest just floating under the next nest and then it just breaks and a yolk falls to the ground and what you don't know, listening to this, unless you've read it, <laughs> is that throughout this book, the author has described the sun as a yoki thing. Golden, like the yolk of an egg, it was a yoki thing dripping across the landscape. But that's how she described like a sunrise or a sunset at one point. Just constantly egg imagery, imagery which I thought, now she does, she does the, it was a blank thing, a, a yoki thing, a wild blank thing. She does that a lot. That's just a convention that's happened. A lot of the reviews, you, you feel this out pretty quickly in the beginning. But this yoki thing, I was just like, apparently this author is just really into this metaphor. Nope. <laughs> she was trying to lay some footprints that make no sense why this would be why I, Isla is thinking about the fucking egg. But anyway... She sees the yolk drop and she goes, wow, it looks like a yolk and the sun. And she goes, funny, I have kept thinking about the sun as an egg the whole time I've been here. And you're like, that doesn't feel like a connection. <laughs> you could have just not mentioned that as a like author and just been like, I was leaving it there subtly through descriptions. But the fact that the character is like, I have constantly been thinking about the sun as a yolk. Wow. Like it just, it's, and it's, it's an egg. It's not a flower. It's, it's. It's a yoke. And so she goes, it's it's too sunny for Aro. So she goes out, she picks it up, she's holding it and she feels it 
flooding her with power. Uh, oh, she also learns at this point, I forgot, her and Aro have a conversation about the fact that it wasn't just Nightshade and Sunling that created Light Lark, but it was also Wildling. Those three realms are the ones that created Light Lark. And so only a Nightshade, a Sunling, or a Wildling can pick up and use the heart. His whole plan is that he thinks somebody used the heart to cast the curses, and that was the original offense. So he wants to find the heart and use it, which would be the repeating of the original offense. She goes, she grabs the heart, she's like, yay! And then at this moment, an arrow just bursts through her chest. Somebody's shot her through the heart. It's those guys that wanted to eat her earlier who happened to be very ancient. They used to be wildlings a long time ago, but they're not anymore, and they weren't cursed. I don't know. But anyway, Aro uses his powers to just burn all of them, but he can't come into the sun. So it's just her holding the heart with an arrow through her chest, just like bleeding out. She like pulls her necklace that Grim gave her. Grim appears. She drops the heart and Grim whisks her off. Aro gallantly tries to go out and get her, but as he sticks his arm through, it just splits and starts like searing off. So he can't, but he tried. Um... She goes off with Grim. Grim uses like wildling healing el elixirs to like revive her, but she also just heals really fast. And she's like, maybe I use some of the heart and now I have some like healing ability, maybe? Eventually, her and Aro meet later that night. Like, he comes the minute it is dusk again and he can come to her. Like, he flies and he's like, you're alive. I have the heart. And she's like, oh, thank God. And he's like, great, we have it. We, we, and she's like, I think I use it. And he's like, perfect. Original offense committed. Now we just have to pick another ruler to die. I vote uh, Nightshade. She had told him when they made the agreement that he was like, I'll protect your realm. You won't be one of the ones that dies. And she's like, can I pick a second realm to be protected? And she was like, obviously Starling. I don't want Celeste to die. Uh, and so he, at this point, he's like, we have to pick the realm that dies. Who's the realm you don't want to die? And she's like, Starling. And he's like, great, Nightshade it is. And she's like, no, no, not Nightshade. <laughs> like she couldn't foresee <laughs> that this would be the outcome and she's like why you can't just condemn him and his his entire people and she was like and you would do that because she's like azul tried to oh yeah someone tried to murder celeste uh and it was azul who like our Ar is like it wouldn't be azul azul is literally like a kind chill dude he, he literally does not care about any of this he's just hoping that if the spells are broken uh the curses are broken he gets to see his long lost dead lover that's it that's the only thing for uh, old Azul. And she's like, you can't do this. Pick Cleo. Cleo sucks. And he's like, nah. Nightshade. Now that we have the heart's <laughs> power, we don't need them anymore. It's the, the best decision. And she's like, <laughs> because now she's heckin' in love. And so she she looks at him and she's like, Aro is actually a bad guy. Despite the bonding and genuine honesty we have had over the past few months, uh, bonding together, he is actually a bad guy, and that was the fa the him being nice was the facade, and he's actually just a grumpy jerk face. So she decides to completely abandon her plan with Aro, despite letting him think that they're still going. She goes to Celeste, and she's like, "Hey, do you love me and do you trust me?" And she's like, "Yes." And she's like, "I want to include Grim on our plans. I know where the Sunling hidden library is that you want to go find. Uh, I bet you the Bond Breakers in there." Let's get it, and then let's use it to save Grim, me, and you. Celeste's like, I'm down. Absolutely, let's do it. So their plan is to use Celeste's powers to crumble part of the castle, which will give Celeste the opportunity to get into the Sunling uh, Tower. And then they're all going to go meet at the Place of Mirrors so that if anyone comes to attack them, they can't use their powers there because nobody can use their powers except for wildlings in that space. And so they're like, perfect, solid plan. She goes off to meet Celeste. She meets Grimm in the woods. And at one point he's like, will you ever be able to forgive me? And he calls her heart. For a lot of the book, he calls her heart eater. And then it gets shortened to heart. Uh, and she's like, there's a way that he says that where I don't think it's just him shortening heart eater. And you're like, yeah, he's telling you you're his heart. Dumbass. <laughs> like, But anyway, and what you actually find out is he confesses, we knew each other before. And I erased your memory coming into the tournament. So you didn't know who I was. And she's like, yo, what the fuck? And, and she's like, no, I've never met you before. And he's like, think about it. When you portaled back to your room the day of the tournament, like, or the day of the centennial, where were you before? And she realizes, and that's the start of the book. She portals into her bedroom. She realizes she can't remember what happened before that at all. He took all of her memories of their time together away from her. Um, so not only did they know each other, but they were lovers. <laughs> Like, they were doing the do on the regs. I don't understand why he tells her this. 
like right now. Why you are literally the plan he is working with requires her to trust them. And like, it's just the weirdest fucking decision to confess right now. So at first she's like, fuck you. You've been lying to me. I don't know what the fuck your deal is. I'm out. And so she runs and she abandons him. Also at this point, despite never before in this entire series uh, or in this entire book, suddenly plants are coming to her aid. <laughs> Do you remember the part where Will and I described a tree throwing barbs and thorns deep into her skin and trying to kill her? Why are the trees being her friend now? You're going to learn something in a minute about her powers or lack thereof that I think the author thinks explains this, but it doesn't because you have the entire before of the book where animals never like trusted her or like aided her and um, trees and plants never trusted nor aided her. All of a sudden trees just start jumping out, separating her from Aro and it, it allows her to run in or not from Aro, from Grimm uh, and it allows her to run in. She's like, Celeste, <laughs> And, and Celeste's like, what's wrong? And she's like, don't worry about it. We'll talk about it later. Do you have the bond breaker? And Celeste's like, yeah, I do. And it's a giant needle. She's like, we're going to just have to do it, me and you. Not with Grimm. And Celeste's like, okay, that's fine. Boo -boo. Grimm is trying to get through. He breaks through the trees. He comes in and he's like, no, don't. And then Aro's there and he's also like, Isla. And then Celeste stabs her hand with the needle and then stabs Isla's hand with the needle. And all of a sudden Isla feels like shit. It's like something is being drained out of her, but she looks at Celeste and Celeste looks great. Skin is luxurious. Her hair, like everything, Celeste is looking amazing, having a good time. And then she looks and Grimm and uh, Aro also look like shit, like, like they're not doing hot. And all of a sudden she realizes they can no longer use her power. Basically, uh, all of a sudden Celeste, it, like trees and stuff start doing things. And again, prior to this, Isla thought, Maybe the trees are finally defending me because they recognize me as the ruler of a uh, wilding. And then all of a sudden the trees are trying to hurt her. And she's like, that's weird. Why are they doing that? And then she realizes it. Celeste is using wildling magic. She's like, what the fuck is happening? And Celeste starts evil cackling. Just straight up <laughs> mustache twirling, evil cackling. <laughs> Little bird, you're so dumb. And goes into a long convoluted spiel that I will do my best to explain in a way that makes sense. Celeste has been working, is not good friends with Isla. She's been using Isla and she's been playing one hell of a long game con. And she's also been working with Grimshaw. What you discover is that Celeste is the old starling ruler, Aurora. Now, once upon a time, Aurora was supposed to marry Aro's older brother. It was supposed to be a union between the Sunlings and the Starlings. Uh, but then Aro's older brother fell in love with a wildling woman, Isla's old uh, ancestor, Violet. Aurora did not take that well. She got <laughs> real fucking upset about it. So she went and found the, the heart and she was able to use it because of a, there is something. There's a lot of complicated um, magic stuff going on and lore and it's not again a lot of the magic in this book is just weird and the motivations of the people in the prior generation of when this first happened also are not super well explained basically she was salty about somebody marrying somebody and decided to just do the curses to try to get ultimate power yeah she she did the curses to make them suffer but she also did curses on her realm as well like and she's she's really blase about the fact that she cast them to fuck up her, like and it fucked up her own realm and all the other realms like what the fuck did skyling and moonling have to do with any of this but fuck you guys you're dead now um and have curses so she made the curses and then she isolated had to pretend to be the ruler of the starlings and because everybody dies at 25 every about 25 years she just pretend to be someone else she just pretend because she can shapeshift she would just pretend that she was dead and then be a new ruler and be that person. And while she was doing that, she was like, man, this sucks. I'd like to break the curses at some point. And then who should portal into her like space and her realm, but a young Isla who has a star stick. And, and what you find out, and this is so dumb. <laughs> it's so dumb. So not only was, yes, Isla seeing Grimm beforehand, but you discover that one of Grimm's old generals fell in love with a wildling woman. Despite the fact that everybody was like, nah, don't do this. She's going to kill you. But he was a very powerful general. Uh, and he also had this magic item that was imbued 
by Grimm himself. The star stick is not starling magic, which is what you were led to believe in in the beginning and what Isa was led to be believe in. It is nightshade. It's a nightshade relic. It is literally Grimm's power, his ability to foop foop to places. It's Grimm's power that she's had. You find out that this old general fell in love with her mom. They did the thing. And he was so powerful, he was able to kind of hold back the wildling curse uh, for uh, long enough to let Isla be born. But then somebody found out about it and killed both of them. And the people, and again, this is so con, like as I'm explaining it, it just <laughs> makes less sense. The people that killed the old uh, wild, like the wildling ruler and the nightshade guy, Isla's parents, were Poppy and Tara, who Celeste, I guess she found out all of this was happening somehow. It doesn't explain how she like got control of Poppy and Tara originally. The other thing is that Isla has magic. It's just that she has wildling and shadow magic and the two are canceling each other out her nightshade magic makes it so that she can't like it you her wildling magic isn't apparent so everybody just assumes she didn't but she has both but yeah so poppy and tara killed her parents and then celeste told them i need to use this girl because celeste's goal is to get all of the powers all of the powers and so she has Starling and she's going to use the bond breaker to get the, or the bond maker to get Isla's powers. So Isla will give her nightshade and uh, wildling powers, but how is she going to get sunling, moonling and skyling powers? Well, if she can get, and again, this is such a weird thing to think of. <laughs> if she can get the king to fall in love with Isla, then Isla will be able to access his powers and then she can drain the king through Isla. So apparently by using the bond ma- the bond maker, it will not only give her Isla's powers and drain Isla's powers, which I said wildling and nightshade, but it will also access her connection to Aro and drain Aro, which will give her Skyling, Starling, or Skyling, Sunling, and Moonling powers. If this sounds convoluted to hear, it's actually a little bit clearer the way Maria is describing it than the way it is in the book where you're just like, what? And also, Aurora, her motivation here is so paper thin. It literally is just cackling villain who wants all the power. But also wants to break the curses all of a sudden. Because here's the thing. She doesn't need to break the curses to get what she wants. She, like, so I don't understand why she's... Because she actively says she's trying to break the curses and that by... The original offense was not using the heart. It was a sunling and a wildling falling in love. Why not just get Aro to fall in love with you? And then, oh, that's, she mentions that. Actually, that that does get mentioned. She's mentioned centennial after centennial, all my overtures toward Aro were unanswered. And so I don't know why she thinks Isla, the wildling, like, is going to... It doesn't really make a lot of sense that that would be the one that, like, worked. It's bizarre. Like, how did you know that Aro would have aligned himself with Isla and that? And also, you find out that Grimm was in on it this whole time. So Grimm and Isla were seeing each other. Eventually, Isla was telling Grimm a lot of stories about Celeste. She, he started getting suspicious of Celeste and the plan uh, she was making. So he confronts Celeste, who reveals herself to be Aurora and tells him of the plan. And all he wants is revenge against the Sunlings for what happened to his people and lands, even though... I can't what? You guys started the war? Anyway, so he wants revenge and down with Aro. <laughs> the only way to drain Aro of his powers and take over, like, because he basically, Celeste is like, I'll let you rule, is to let his girlfriend slash lover forget who he is and seduce another man. So he knows at the start of the book that the woman he's in love with needs to seduce another man and he agrees to go along with it. And that's why he takes away her memories because he knew there was no way she would be able to seduce him. Like if if they told her, hey, you just need to do this. It wasn't going to happen. And you're like, why? Why any of this? What the fuck? It's one of those things where the villains, instead of the plot of the book springing from the villains' plans and the things that came before, they're retroactively made up 
to fit what happens in the book, it feels like, because they're so convoluted and like, what? Celeste is like, I shall kill you. Or Aurora is like, I shall kill you now. And or I, Isla is like, I have my star stick where I always keep it. Apparently all of her outfits just have a sleeve, like a little pocket <laughs> down the spine where she keeps this. And she's like, yeah, portal out. She portals back to her tower in Wildling Realm. She sees Poppy and she's like, fuck you, you killed my parents. And Poppy's like, you have to understand. Celeste told us that uh, we had to keep you isolated and we couldn't let you use your magic because the nightshade magic would kill you and this was the only way to save our people and blah 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 but we love you and she's like no fuck you and she's she goes and she gets her two swords so what you learn that you've never known beforehand is her preferred fighting style is double handed two swords a sword in each baby and that's her preferred and she has these two blades that she she has a wall of blades she grabs them why we didn't bring these with her i will never understand she needed to power up at the last minute yeah and she puts on all of her armor like all of her shit again why she couldn't bring this with her never know so she puts it on and she's like fuck grimshaw he lied to me he is obviously not taking my consent into any consideration but you know who doesn't deserve to die because he she's like fuck it let grim die celeste can have him uh, or Aurora can have him. Uh, but Aro was actually just honest and trying to do the right thing this whole time. And I kind of fucked up and I can't leave him to die. So she portals back in, baby. And she's like, yo, so like Aurora. And Aurora's like, you dumb ass idiot. You came, you escaped. Now you're here. And now I'm going to fuck you up. They start fighting. Aro's trying to help, but he has no powers. And, and she's also like engulfed them in like tree roots. Uh, Aro and Grim. Isla gets the bond breaker stabs celeste and stabs herself again so the powers go back into her and go back to aro but again no magic can be used here except for the wildling magic and so she tries to access the wildling she also like she doesn't just stab celeste she stabs her through the heart celeste or aurora's dead and then she starts falling because all the wildling magic stops working and so the branches that were holding them up kind of disappear and she's like i can use them i've got and then she's like oh wait i don't know despite the fact that i now know that i have them i've never been able to access them i can't suddenly just use them it's something you have to learn and so she's falling and she's gonna die and she's falling and all of a sudden a tree root comes out of nowhere and grabs her and it pulls her up and as she scrambles back up the the hole that she was falling into she sees aro put his hands down and the tree root falls and she realizes aro can use because earlier the revelation was Aro she had Aro's power in her because he loved her and she didn't know that she didn't realize he he was doing her a heck and loving it was a, a surprise but now surprise he was able to use wildling magic because guess what she does him a heck and loving and it just like for the character to not like it's just <laughs> like I would have liked this in a different book like I would have loved this revelation and for her to be like oh fuck I do I do love him. And there's like a nice growth of it against slow burn, but like mm -hmm. it's not executed super well. Because she hasn't gotten to the point where she, like she's fond of him and she feels fond of him, but she hasn't gotten close enough yet to be like, oh yeah, in love. You know, like, like she was, she was at the stage of like having a crush and, you know, maybe you could say Aro was past that stage, but she's been fucking around with Grimm this whole time who she did love. And so it just comes like, this the revelation between Grimm and all of that shit needed to happen farther apart from Aro being able to use her power so that it felt like she had enough time to be like, okay, I no longer love Grimm. Because in this moment, Grimm can't use her powers, she realizes, because she doesn't love him anymore. And that's a weird switch. That is an immediate whoop, whoop, switch. Or you can read it, the implication is that she's this entire time hasn't loved Grimm, but she has been in falling in love with Aro, but I don't know. The book, it, like, it doesn't... It does not work great. And so she like looks at Aro and she's like, oh, I love him. And I'm pretty sure that's how the book ends. No. Then Grimjaw teleports away. Her and Aro later in the castle are like, Oh, okay. We're kind of like happy together and stuff, but we're not going to jump in into anything. Also, did all of the the starlings die? Like, I wasn't quite clear on that because Aurora died. No, no, they should all be dead. All of the starlings should be dead. It's not made like a big deal of. Nope. She doesn't think like, oh, I just committed genocide on an entire ethnic group. So if that didn't happen, that would be super weird. And if it did happen, it would be weird. Oh, and also the curses are gone now. Right. The curses are gone now. She hasn't gone back to Wildling because she just doesn't know how to feel about it. She fully moved. She's just living in the castle now. And the book ends with her going to that one locked door and being like, I'm ready to open it now and try to figure out what was going on with my mom and my parents and stuff and Ara's with her and like it does 
feel sort of like she's been through a lot and she's kind of a different person now a little bit. Again, the art, her arc is not terrible and there's a lot of internality to her that works. I didn't love her as a main character. Aster did put in some of the work. And so again, that's kind of how I feel about the book as a whole is like, it's not terrible. We've read much worse, worse books. Absolutely. It's not good. Like, please, nobody look at this and think we're saying it's a good book. We're not. Are there <laughs> aspects that were decently done? Absolutely. But I think the best you could say about those aspects is that they are decent. <laughs> Again, like in the ranking of like, great, good, decent, fine, not great, bad, terrible. <laughs> like that's if that's a scale we're using, then this this the, the whole book is like, in fine, not good if you're a middle schooler picking up this book i think you'll like it i yeah. think if you're a normal ya fan though i don't think you're gonna like it because ya as a whole is a little bit more sophisticated than this um and i say that as someone who's like had issues with ya in the past but like this is not a book to be read by an adult even an adult who likes YA. yeah that, that checks out like that's sort of i think the best way to look at it and again it really like it was not it's it's really been dragging and and people are really folk and again the name and convey conventions dumb as heck a yoki <laughs> thing a wildling so thing very repetitive and you notice when it happens and i was listening to the audiobook so the fact that i noticed when it happened like lets you know because it's really one of the things will and i've spoken about is it's hard to really appreciate prose or realize when prose is being really mechanical uh and repetitive in audiobook because the audiobook narrator can do a world of good to make things sound natural that don't normally. <laughs> and so props to this audiobook narrator for trying to make the love scenes decent. <laughs> not succeeded, but that was not her fault. What she was given to work with, uh, not great. I was okay with the book for like the middle chunk. And and for I liked kind of the finding the heart. I liked some of the action scenes. They were fine. As Will and I have both said, the the romance blossoming between her and Aro weirdly nicely done not the worst we've seen we've seen so 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 much worse and this was like okay it was nice that in the end you find out R is going to be the actual love interest and not grimshaw the the potato <laughs> like the, the dark brownie potato man Goff. he isn't even though like again it's like underworld aesthetic and like that just makes him bad and he's flirty and sassy and like quippy you know one of those guys maybe i just like grumpier love interests man but it just, it felt like there was more genuine growth between the two of them than there was with like, kind of almost immediately with Grim and her, you were like, oh, this is a love interest, you know? And then her and Aro, it was like, oh. Interesting. They like each other. It is bizarre that both of her love interests are like at least 500 years older than her. <laughs> yeah, this is one of those books where you're just like, oh, that was odd. I don't like it. I really don't at all. It makes me that's done. <laughs> the amount of experience those two men have, like just with life, and then this like twenty six year old or however old she is, just like bumbling her way through things. And yet, because I know people are gonna complain about it, we did like in Uprooted that relationship. But I don't think he was 500. He was not 500 years old. If anything, he was. And listen, it is still a big age gap. But the thing is, like, that guy is, like, so isolated. His life experiences feel very far away. I guess if it's done well, if it's done well, it's, I, I'm willing to. Novik is a much better writer. And there also doesn't feel like there is a power imbalance going on. It feels like there are two characters who naturally are coming together somewhat. Mm -hmm. And they also aren't, like, a couple couple. Like, they have sex before a big battle. And then also they're fond of each other in a way that's a little bit romantic and could blossom into even more over time. And then they really only kind of like get into it when she's really come into her own as a character. Like the entire ending of that book is you realizing, oh man, this she has discovered who she is and she is comfortable with herself, with her life. This is like she is committed hard to what she wants out of life. And so then him returning and them committing to like semi like just the, the beginning of committing to each other feels really adorable and earned um but yeah it really like it, it was it good no was it the worst no was cyborg tinker the worst yes <laughs> yes it was 
Yes, Save Your Sister was worse for me. I can understand why Save Your Sister is worse for you, but I think Cyborg Tinker is genuinely worse. I don't know. Structurally, Save Your Sister had so many issues in terms of just getting through it and the experience of reading it. But I think in terms of, yeah, Cyborg Tinkerer feels even worse in like a lot of other ways. Like the prose is worse. The dialogue somehow is worse. And there's not even like the redeeming edge. Cause like, listen, Save Your Sister was not a fun book to read, but I would say it was like, just as far as prose better written than Cyborg Tinkerer. And not, and which is not to say, and I don't want anyone to take that quote out of context. Um, it's not to say that I think Moresi is like, has good prose. Less painful is the scale we're, yes. we're grading on. Yes. So yeah, that's Light Lark. Um, it's probably, it's really not worth the hullabaloo. It really isn't. Either pro or, or anti. It's just like, okay, this is just a normal middle school YA book. The amount of attention it is getting is just bizarre. Have you guys read Light Lark? Have you read other books by Alex Astor? Had you heard about this beforehand? You know, I know well, we have lots of cool hip happening uh, viewers who are like, they're Zoomers who know about TikTok. I totally know about TikTok too, because I'm awesome and cool. Um, I did not learn about this from the YouTuber I mostly edit. Um, if you are actually interested in the more like TikTok portion of it, um, there is a video by Swell Entertainment that I actually edited that you can go and check out. Thanks to everybody for sticking with us. Let us know in the comments uh, below. And we love you, our parasocial darlings. Bye.